Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, happy Friday um, on this gorgeous, beautiful Sunday, uh, sunny morning. Um, today or this morning, we're going to be going over um, the payroll first for redesign. So we'll go ahead and get started. Again, if you have any questions, please um, unmute yourself or you can enter in a chat. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, the first one would be the filing deadline to a reminder to your districts and ITCs, you, um, January 31st to make sure they have all their W-2 and W-3 information sent to the business service online or submit by paper form W-2. Um, again, so if it falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or a legal holiday, um, the deadline will always be the next business day. And then the, to get the W-2s to your employees, um, that deadline is January 31st. Um, updates for 2021 tax filing would be your qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement. Um, this would be any eligible employers um, to pay or reimburse your medical care expenses after the employee provides the proof of the coverage. And the maximum reimbursement for this is $5,300, $10,700 if it, it also it provides your reimbursement for family members um, because previously it was 5,200 and 10,600. So that is a change. And again, this amount would be, would go in your box 12, quote FF of the employer's um, W-2. The next thing is the dependent care changed this year. Now it's 10,500. Um, this is a one-year increase for the exclusion of employer um, provided dependent care from 5,000 to 10,500. And this was because of that American Rescue Plan Act. So again, a reminder for that, that did um, increase. Um, the flexible um, spending, um, there is a limit on the flexible spending arrangement. Again, this cafeteria plan for 2021, again, it may not allow the employee to, re, to request a salary reduction for the contributions um, in excess of $2,750. Um, again, the salary reduction contribution is in excess of, of the $2,750 um, are paid to the employee, and then these have to be reported as wages. Um, so that the taxes are withheld um, and the employment tax purposes um, on the employee's W-2. Um, again, the salary reduction contribution limit for the 2,750, um, this does not include any amount that was carried over from the previous year. So for 20 and 21, there isn't a limitation on that amount that can be carried over from the previous year. So you, um, if so, if they can provide in your plan. Uh, again, if they have any questions on this, um, they want to make sure they contact their legal advisor or the tax advisor on this. So we'll go ahead and get started on the W-2 processing for pre-W-2. Um, as of now, we do not have a W-2 maintenance set up and redesign like we do in Classic, but we do have a feedback juror issue created for that so that um, so we are aware of that. And what they can do for now is if they want it, they can go ahead and enter the employee in Classic under BioScreen and then run W-2 maintenance out of Classic to make sure that that employee social security number um, is correct. Um, the other thing they can do is create a spreadsheet using the employee grid and redesign and pull in the social security number, their last name and first name, middle name, birth date, gender, and, and then create this report by using the report button, but then they were gonna have to add the TPV entry code as well as the 214 process code and also the file request data, the OEV S000 in that file. So again, it will look like this when you're creating that, when you create that spreadsheet. And then what they can do from here is go to the SSA um, file and they can go ahead and submit that to SSA. And again, if they have questions on that, 
they can go ahead to this link here that we included, and that will tell them, um, make sure the specs um, are correct on the file that you have and where to submit it. Okay. For um, OSDI reporting, um, they wanna make sure that they have the correct information entered in their payroll item configuration for the abbreviation and the OSD code entered for their OSDI um, payroll item configurations. Again, this probably has been done. If you have any new ones that have been added this year, those are the ones you're gonna to wanna to make sure that um, are correct. So again, under payroll item configuration, under core, you wanna make sure you enter the OSDI code and the W2 abbreviation is correct for you, those um, OSDI tax districts. For your city, you wanna make sure under payroll item configuration that the entity code is entered because when we create the file for electronic, that needs to be included in there in order for that city to be included on that take file. So again, under payroll item configuration, you wanna to go to city tax and make sure the tax entity code is entered in correctly. For the CCA RITA, um, again, payroll item configuration, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that those codes are entered correctly or order for submit on the submission file to be included. And again, if they have any questions, please look at the RITA and CCA websites for that, or they can contact them if they have questions. And again, on the payroll item configuration under core, you are gonna to wanna to go to the bottom. Rita is located at the bottom of that, of this city file on the pair item. Enter in this um, Rita um, number and then the Rita description. For CCA, you're gonna find that closer to the top of the city um, file. And you're gonna to wanna to enter in the CCA and the CCA description here. Now the report to CCA, that's going to matter a little bit on um, this next um, PowerPoint that I'm gonna show you. So um, the verify, you wanna make sure on the payroll item um, for the each employee, um, are they employed because they are just employed because they um, are not a residence or they live in the city and, and then that should be coded as an R. So C for employment and R for residence. Again, we included the website here if you have any questions on Rita in Ohio for that. And what you wanna do is make sure you go to the employee's payroll item and they wanna make sure this is filled in, deduction type. Is it because they're employed because um, they just work there or is it because they actually live in the city? And that would be residence. So they wanna make sure that is filled out for each um, city record on payroll item for that employee. <clears throat> Again, um, CCA has been a little bit stricter over the past years on their addresses. So you wanna make sure your districts uh, go to this website here and verify that the addresses are entered in correctly because they have to be in USPS standards. That's what the CCA looks at. So in, court, in order for the CCA um, employees to be included um, correctly on the tape file, um, this was uh, last year also. Um, so again, um, if any new districts have been added um, uh, with the city, excuse me, with new cities being added, um, they wanna make sure they go to this website and look at these appendix. So if a CCA city is on this appendix A, the payroll item configuration, you need to have it set as report to CCA as yes. Valid CCA code, which will show on those um, on this website, and then the valid CCA city description. Um, if the CCA is not listed on that appendix A, but then you find it on the B appendix, then they need to have that payroll item configuration set report to CCA flag as blank, not checked, valid CCA and then the valid CCA city name. And then if that CCA, they cannot find it on B or C, 
then they need to do the following on the configuration, leave this uh, report to CCA flag blank, um, CCA code you leave blank, and then the valid CCA name found in the Ohio municipal, municipal income tax um, rate table. So again, a little bit of work, but again, this was um, in set for last year already. So a lot of these should be done already. Um, it would only be probably for maybe um, cities that have been added just recently. Um, again, um, they need to look this up on the spreadsheet we included here that includes uh, the description, um, what they would need to enter for the CCA description. And again, if they can't find their city on this sheet, um, definitely have them call the CCA and they can help them with that. But this will save them a lot of heartache in that um, when they do start submitting and they get the files um, rejected um, if they start doing this now. For the next thing would be your W-2 processing county tax. Um, again, um, districts that are um, on the edge with Indiana, um, they probably already know this, um, Indiana County, they have an Indiana County tax code that needs to be um, set up. Um, in order for W-2 PROC to handle this correctly, they got to make sure that they create a municipality um, city record for that county tax and then create a payee and enter an IN for the abbreviation of Indiana as a state and the payee address in order for that to be correctly um, picked up on the W-2 PROC is ran. So again, here's a payroll item configuration. You wanna create a city tax, you tax entity code, make sure that is correct. And then down here at the bottom, the payee address, you wanna make sure that um, the IN, because you this already would have been created on the payee side, and then you just select that and make sure the IN. So that's what the W2 proc is looking for. Okay. For state taxes, um, the payroll item configuration, you're going to want to make sure for any surrounding states around Ohio that your districts may um, have employees from, they want to make sure that um, state ID is correct for each um, payroll item configuration for those states. Again, they may have to contact the state if they have questions on that. For HSA, health savings account. Um, again, you're going to have an annuity type set up under payroll and configuration, and it's going to be set as other, even if there is no employee amounts withheld. So you're going to want to make sure on the payroll item configuration for type of health savings account that that is set up as other. The employee expense reimbursement, if the district desired amounts paid through warrant to appear on the W-2 form as wages, then you're going to go ahead and look on the expense reimbursement options document and the special processing through adjustments may be needed. So any manual changes um, may be needed on that. So again, we included that on our wiki. Um, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. For movie expenses, again, um, this is only for active military only. So the re reimbursements, including payments made directly to the third party for active military employees only be entered in the adjustment screen. So this amount, um, again, is treated as an excludable fringe benefit. Um, again, if they have questions, um, always contact their legal advisors on that and then manually enter that in the um, as excluded about under the federal record under adjustment journal, which is located under um, core. So you want to select the employee, payroll item 001, type of moving expense, and the amount. For fringe benefits, again, if they have any questions, please have them contact the legal advisor. Um, what they're going to want to do for this is enter the taxable fringe amount and adjustments. Um, all tuition reimbursements above the 5250, these are considered fringe benefits and these need to be taxed. So that amount above that 5250 paid for tuition reimbursement would go in the adjustment journal under federal, under fringe benefits height. So make sure you have the O1 record, fringe benefit, and the amount. And it will tax anything above that 5250. For the next fringe benefit, um, when they are saved, when that is clicked, then um, 
they will update the total and taxable gross field on the payroll items for the federal and state. And this will show and reflect on the W-2 report, W-2 form for that employee. For the life insurance, um, nothing has changed on this. Um, again, if the districts um, try to get this in before their last payment, and they actually can start entering that now. If they have these figures, they can have that in, um, start entering that now here in November. They don't have to wait to the last uh, pay in December. So they can get that done and then that will um, not worry them that they didn't get that in because the manual changes will have to be updated then if they don't. So they can enter this in current or future. They wanna select the life insurance pay type. And then this will tax them accordingly to the IRS. So for the life insurance um, amount, this will tax the Medicare or Social Security um, will be calculated when they um, run the payroll. Um, but again, during the payroll, no federal, higher or OSD tax amounts will be calculated. So the software provides them um, the ability to actually um, tax uh, their city records for this non-cash earnings if the district um, has to have this done. Again, they will have to contact their city um, in order to figure find this out if they're supposed to tax that non-cash earnings or not. So if they do, then that would be on the payroll item um, configuration screen. You have to make sure that they um, find that as yes. Um, if the life insurance was not added before the last pay, um, they want to make sure that they're going to have to do um, a couple manual changes in order for it to show correctly on the W-2 form, and then they will pay for that after the fact when they um, um, send it in for their tax advisor. Um, they want to click on create. Um, they want to find the employee, choose the all one federal um, payroll item. Um, they want to make sure they do the life insurance as the pay type and then tracks and transaction date and amount. Again, under core investment journal, and then payroll item, then life insurance, and then enter the amount. For life insurance, um, when, they, when that button is actually saved, the tax life insurance premium, that will be federal, state, OSA, and city, and the Medicare. And again, this will then be put on the W-2 report for that employee in their um, W-2 form. Again, if they have Medicare withholding, um, if it was paid by the employee, or maybe a uh, full pickup by the board, then they're gonna have to do um, an adjustment and they're gonna to have to do adjustment for the board pickup amount of the payroll item. And then if it's for the employee portion, they're gonna to have to do amount withheld and then what the board pays under the board amount of payroll item. So again, they probably will have to contact an employee to pay for that uh, Medicare portion if they didn't enter it before the last pay. Okay. Um, dependent care. The max change from 5,000 to 105. If not using the dependent care payroll item type, um, you want to make sure that they do an core adjustment again under and then cl um, click on create. So the 105 is for married. And they want to go ahead and enter 001, dependent care, and the amount. So again, when after they save that, anything above that 10-5 threshold um, for that dependent care, this is reflected on the employee's W-2, W form for the total amount of dependent care. So they would pay taxes then above that 10-5. And that was shown in their box 10 on the W-2. Pre-W-2 processing vehicle lease, um, use of company vehicle, you want to calculate lease uh, vehicle value. Um, again, this needs to be manually entered on the adjustments under core. So you would have your payroll item under 01, the vehicle lease type, and the amount of the vehicle lease for the year. So again, after they save, what this does then, um, it adds the taxes. Um, 
updates the total and taxable gross to the federal and state. And then this will be reflect on the employee's W-2 report. Um, and the vehicle lease amount will appear in box 14 of the W-2. So the W-2 process employer sponsored healthcare costs. Uh, this is the Affordable Care Act. Um, what this does, the, it requires employees, which just hasn't changed. This has been over the same. Um, they have to make sure they report how much they're paying for the employer, uh, the employer portion and the employee portion. So this, um, nothing has changed on this. I'm sorry. Hello. Hi, sorry. I asked a question in the chat okay. and sorry. didn't see a response. I didn't want you to get too far past where we were at. Okay. Because um, I had a question about the fringe benefits. Okay. Um, this is Andrew with WOCO. Um, we Andrew. actually had, a, me and you had a ticket about this uh, last year um, and you helped me a lot with it. And I just wanted to make sure um, that what we talked about last year, we still ever, I was on the correct page. Everybody was on the correct page. So when you do that fringe benefit type, it, I mean, it says it in the PowerPoint, it increases the federal and the state taxable gross. Um, but some fringe benefits are taxable to Medicare too. Like, so you told me, okay, so, you know, obviously you guys aren't the IRS. So, but if you determine that it's taxable to federal and state only, you would do fringe. And then if it's also taxable to Medicare, that there's another type called taxable benefit. That's like, you would do it the same way with the adjustment journal. You just pick taxable benefit instead of fringe benefit. And you okay. said, you know, obviously that's not SSDT's job to, you know, interpret the mm -hmm. nuances of their fringe, but each district's okay. fringe benefit. Um, so, um, cause we had talked about making sure you actually, I have a note from you that says, make sure we get this in the PowerPoint for the calendar you're in. Okay. So um, that was the question. And then the other question I, the other thing I wanted to say about that is, you know, if you, if it's taxable benefit, if you add it after the fact, you're going to end up with problems because inflating the Medicare gross without taxing for it. It's like the same thing you just went through with NC1, right? If you don't, if you add that after the fact, it's gonna create problems to the Medicare gross. So the same thing would happen with the taxable benefit if you add it after the fact, you'd have to do the same process as an NC1 payment. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't, I mean, that's not in here and we're gonna include that for our districts, but I know we had one district um, determined that they, legally at least one determined they legally needed to be using a taxable benefit instead of fringe for something specific gotcha. to them okay. so I, you know i just wanted okay. to you know see what your opinion was about that and tell people that i have no idea what is and isn't you know that's a complicated irs question right but um, um i can go ahead and, and take a look at that um, I'll have to go back and look at your ticket from last year um, and see what we discussed on that. Um, okay. I, I wrote down your name and I will get back to you on that um, and let you know okay. um, about that um, core item adjustment journal. Do you want, me to, what they... do you want, do you want sorry, me to reopen ahead. the ticket? Sure. Do you yeah, want me you to reopen the ticket so that you can sure. see it? Okay. Yeah, because yeah, I dug be it up this morning to... Look at that. I just want to make sure that if somebody else is in the situation, okay. I mean, I know we have a district that needs to use that, that they know that like this fringe benefit thing isn't going to do pick up the Medicare, gotcha. um, which okay. may sure. or may not be what you want, depending on right. your situation. situation. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead and reopen that ticket and then we can take a look at that and make sure that you guys are set for that district that you have and make sure they're set okay. up correctly. So. Okay. okay, great. Thanks, awesome. Andrew. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see where we'll go back to where we were. Um, we were. We were on slide 40, Andrea. Thank you. <laughs> I was lost. I was like, I couldn't remember where I was, but thank you very much. 
Um, okay, on to the next then. Um, the Affordable Care Act requires employers um, to report the coverage um, for the any employer um, health care. So this would be the employer portion that is, they're paying for their employee and the employee portion. So the uh, IRS wants to know this um, for their each our district. Um, again, this is just informational purposes um, only. So what they would need to do, um, this needs to go on box 12 using code DD. And this is for uh, districts filed 250 or more W-2s for the preceding year. Um, again, this does not include anything from life, dental, or vision. Um, that are, This is not required. Um, again, if that is part of their medical plan and that's already in that figure, then they can go ahead and do that. They don't have to get, you know, figure out what the difference is. Um, again, if they have any questions, we included the link here for them. Um, again, um, they do not want to include um, HSA, health savings. That would not be included in this um, box because that goes in box 12 using code D. So just a reminder that that is not included. The box employer health coverage um, on the regular and annuity payroll item um, configuration plus any core adjustments for the health insurance entries um, are used to calculate uh, this cost. So um, if they have that box checked in the payroll item configuration, um, what it's going to do is going to look at the payroll items for each employee, the year to date amount. And that's what it's going to use to move into that box. And that's what this is here on the payroll item configuration. So they just wanna make sure that this box is checked for their districts um, for their health insurance. So the system will automatically then include that when they run W-2 PAC and they don't have to do anything. Um, again, if they're not currently processing um, that board portion through payroll um, and they, they can just track that on their own, um, if not wanting to include that on their employer distributions um, submission files, all they have to do is go into that payroll item configuration and leave those object codes fields blank. So if they're paying it just directly out of USAS, then yeah, they can they don't have to include that on their employee distributions. So that's just a, a note that we wanted to add. So if the district is only tracking the employee portion of that, um, what the district will probably have to do then is create a spreadsheet using um, the mass load, and we included the URL here um, that they can get so they can get the fields that they need to create that spreadsheet and they wanna put on the board year to day cost for the employee for the health insurance. So then they wanna to go to um, the mass load and they wanna include the um, adjustments. And then this file contains the board amount of the payroll item data. And that is the amount that's not tracked to um, the payroll system. So again, they would um, enter that figure on that spreadsheet, choose the file, choose the adjustment journal, and then that will go ahead and put those um, figures into the adjustment journal um, through the spreadsheet. So they don't have to do it manually if they have a lot to do. Um, again, if the employee is paying the insurance out of pocket, so this amount has to be um, added. So what they're gonna wanna do is again, use the adjustments, uh, find the employee, um, they're going to want to use the payroll item under 001 and choose the um, type of health insurance. And then they're going to enter in that amount for that employee. Now, if the employee insurance is paid half out of pocket and other half through the payroll, again, they're going to need to add that amount doing the same thing under adjustments under the 001 using the health insurance, and they're going to enter that amount. So the half of that portion that they're not um, using that, that they're not um, using through payroll. So again, they use the 01 health insurance and again, the amount. And again, they make sure they only are ending the amount that is not tracked through payroll. So that gets added to that figure of that year to date figure on their W-2 then. So again, when they save, then what that does, does is um, put that employer health coverage on code DD of their W-2.
Again, a spreadsheet can be um, uploaded um, using the appropriate formatted fields, again, through the mass load. And then they, they can go ahead and under um, utilities, mass load into the federal code record and um, use the type of health insurance. The health reimbursement arrangement. <clears throat> Again, these are for districts that have less than 50 full-time employees. Those who work 130 hours or 30 or more hours a week for 120 consecutive days. So I'm not sure how many ITCs have any um, districts that are less than 50 full-time employees. Um, again, if they have questions on them, they can ask um, their health or their um, legal advisor on this. And what this amount is, is for the code FF for, and, and it'll be located in box 12. So the maximum reimbursement for the eligible employee is 5,300, 10,700 for family members. So again, um, if they do have any districts with this, they want to make sure that um, they go ahead and get this entered under core adjustment using the health reimburse type. And then that will put it on their as their box 12 on their as code FF on the W2 form. And again, uh, this is where they would find that 001 health reimbursement and the total amount. Um, On to the W-2 report and submission option. Um, what this program does is re, um, create your W-2 report for balancing, create your W-2 form data XML file for laser printing, and then again, the W-2 tape submission files for reporting. So what they want to do is go to W-2 report, And then they're gonna to wanna to make sure they fill out their format. They're, they can put it in a different report title if they, um, have, if they want to. Make sure their federal ID and state ID is correct. That automatically already is filled in. What kind of employer there are. So they would need to know that. And again, we have sort options. They can do it by social security number, name, and then we have department employee name. So again, there's a few options that they can choose if they wanna be able to sort it by different. Make sure they include the report year. Um, again, um, they can run this report just to um, include errors if they want to uh, look at employees with the errors first so they can get those cleared up. Uh, if they don't want to, um, they can unclick the report button and then that will include everybody and the employees that have errors listed. So it might be just cleaner to do the report employees first, find out which ones are, have the errors, clean those up, and then go ahead and do another one with report with everybody. And then um, again, if you want to include the fringe benefit flag, then then they can go ahead and um, select the employee or select the uh, payroll item configurations or what they want to include on box 14. And again, if they would need to just run a W-2 for a certain employee because they need to check something, they can have that option too. Just select it and click add. And then select if they want to run it by pay group, they can also have that option. Okay. And then go ahead and generate uh, the report. And then they want to go ahead, like I said, balance and look at all the warnings and errors. For that box 14, we'll go over that a little bit. Um, but this allows the districts to print the additional information on box 14 other. Um, again, um, we changed this year. Now they have the option that they can um, enter multiple, not just six. They can enter in as many, I, I don't even know what the limit is actually, but they can go above six in here. So, but it will still only select the first three for the employee. So the employee has six of these, it's only gonna select those first three. And it's always gonna be vehicle lease. Um, that's always included if the employee has that. So I just wanna just update that portion. Um, like I said, lease vehicle is always included. Um, now the COVID-19 codes you can include. Other users' values are secondary, fringe benefits, serves union dues. Um, again, it's only gonna pick up the first three. And like I said, if they have vehicle lease, it's always gonna include their vehicle lease first. And then it's going to pick up maybe the first three of the COVID or first two of the COVID if they have all three entered. 
For balancing, um, again, they want to look at their 941 totals for the year. Um, they can run the employee earnings register, um, payroll items that represent these amounts for the employees that were withheld during the calendar year. We'll go ahead and look at the quarter report, look at the year-to-date figures. And again, they're going to want to make sure they balance the federal, Ohio, and city tax and the gross amounts. So again, on their 941 data, they're going to want to make sure they look at the year-to-date total and then the W-2 report total. These two should match unless they have some special payments, which we'll go over um, a little later. Again, on the earnings register, they can look at the employee amount column under the payment totals. Amounts in this column on the earnings register should be used for balancing. So again, they can use this column here. On the W-2 um, balancing for the quarter report, deduction item summary. Under here, they will want to use the year-to-date totals. And then they want to use that amount um, for balancing also. On the W-2 report, under the report summary, the tax withheld, then they were going to want to use this line to compare. For W-2 balancing, items that affect balancing between the W-2 report and quarter, um, again, we have that included on our wiki, um, a list of them, uh, specific effects. Um, a couple of them are dependent care benefits. Again, that's changed from 10,500 now for the married. Any fringe benefits, the Medicare pickup amounts, the taxable third-party sick pay, um, the use of the company vehicle, um, maybe the COVID-19 amounts, and again, the empl employee expense reimbursements that were paid through the warrant side. So again, we have that document also on the wiki. Some other things. Um, the first one was the dependent care benefits. Again, anything um, limit over the 10,500, this is going to be added to that total and taxable gross amount for the employees federal, um, Ohio and city, total and taxable amount. And that was shown the W-2 report in their form. So let's say they have an example, um, they have a total of 16,000 um, is added to the adjustable to dependent care on the one one record. Um, only the 5,500 is going to be added to the total and taxable gross fields. So the system knows not anything over 10.5, it's going to pick up. And again, this is going to cause that gross amount on the W-2 report to be higher. So again, dependent care, 16,000 under the 001. For your fringe benefits, um, any adjustments that are made under the old run for your fringe, um, what this is going to do, um, all the, the total and taxable gross amounts um, be added to the federal Ohio records. So again, this is going to cause their gross amounts in the W-2 report to be a little higher. So fringe benefits in the amount. The Medicare pickup. This amount added to the total and taxable gross amounts, again, to the federal Ohio and OSDI records, and it's going to be um, cause your gross W-2 amounts to be higher than your quarter. Um, another thing, if they tax the employer amounts for the city records, um, on the payroll item configuration, um, they need to make sure that box is um, checked correctly or unchecked. Um, again, they can ask their cities on that, um, contact them if they are taxing that um, employer amount for their Medicare. The Medicare pickup box then should be checked if they are taxing it, um, that Medicare pickup. So what that will happen then is the Medicare pickup part will be added to that city total and taxable gross on the W-2 report, and then that employee will pay for that tax after the fact. They will pay for it when they're submitting their um, taxes. So again, here is an example. So if they're just um, have the Medicare pickup, that's going to be included in those totals, and then they're going to pay for it after the fact, not during payroll. 
Now, if they tax the employer amount during payroll, then they're going to want to make sure that box is checked. And then any um, Medicare, I mean, the Medicare pickup um, needs to be added. So then that means the tax is withheld during the payroll. So again, what they're going to want to do is make sure this box is unchecked. This box is checked under the um, employer paid amounts to be taxed, tax employer amounts, and then they need to include um, anything that like the 692 uh, Medicare, the system will know then to look at anybody that has Medicare pickup and they're going to be taxed during the payroll. For the taxable third party sick pay, um, again, we have that included in our um, sick pay instructions and then an example of that on the wiki. Um, the users will need to um, add this amount under core adjustments and under total gross and taxable gross for each 001, federal Ohio and OSDI records. And what this does then is going to make that gross amount on the W-2 report higher than it would be on the quarter. So again, that has to be done for each one. So here's an example, um, 001, make sure they do total gross, taxable gross. And then again for 002, and then for the 800 for the OSDI. Now, if it's non-taxable third-party sick pay, um, again, this is not gonna affect any balancing for your district or the taxes. So all they would have to do is go to the core adjustments, go to third-party sick pay for the type, and enter that amount in the 01 record. Um, by now, it's, there might be already sending the third-party sick pays out from the company, so the district should be getting those by now, but if not, they may want to contact them. And then this amount is going to print on that um, box 12 with a code J for that employee. For company vehicle, um, if, uh, if they're using a company vehicle, again, the adjustment under core, they need to add that vehicle lease and to the federal record, the 001. And again, what this does is add that vehicle lease to the federal taxable and total gross of federal Ohio total on the W-2 report. Again, this is gonna cause their W-2 report to be higher than their quarter report. Again, here's an example, federal 001, vehicle lease and the amount. Employee reimbursements. Um, if the district wants to um, employee reimbursements um, that were paid through the warrant site to appear on their W-2 as wages and adjustments are gonna need to be made. And again, this, is, this will create a balancing difference between their quarter report and W-2. Um, so it's gonna show the W-2 will show higher gross amounts than that was actually paid through payroll. Again, if you have questions, please see the expense reimbursement document that we included on the wiki. And again, if you have questions beyond that, you can please enter uh, a ticket and we will help you with that. And again, you might have to contact your legal advisor on some of it um, if it's more legal side of it. For balancing problems, um, the voided checks from the prior calendar year. Um, again, um, you can go to check register um, on the grid, um, enter a transaction type of payroll equals payroll. And then you can enter a um, status of V in the column and then anything greater in the void date of 1231-2020. And what this will do is just pull in all the voided checks between the dates between 121 and 1230, 1231 of 2021. And again, you can do the same thing for transaction type equals refund if they did a void for any refund checks through the prior year. And then you can just create a report and this will show any voided checks from the prior year because that could cause balancing issues. Um, you can create a report to pull in any refund of annuity without it without the prior year calendar. Again, you can go to payments refund checks and then show issue dates on the on the grid file. Make sure that's included. You can, I think it's already on there, but you can use the more option. And then you're going to enter your filter in between 1 1 2021 and then two dots and then the 2021. Um, 20 of 21 and click on the report. And you wanna do the same thing for refund of ACH. So there's just, a, um, can be a little helpful on trying to find um, if you're having balancing issues.
again, um, manual updates. Um, again, for the core adjustments, you can go there and enter a transaction date in the grid. Um, filter, like example, if you want to look for anything that was done on the old one record, filter the code out. Um, search for any types manually added, like fringe benefits, health insurance, dependent care, vehicle lease. Uh, this could help with your balancing issue. Um, again, filter codes that maybe are 501 through 550. Um, again, using the two dots in the middle, that will include everything between 501 and 550. Um, the filter type then that is out of balance, um, maybe the total gross amount withheld, um, go ahead and look at those figures. Maybe for your error warning messages that you might get, um, what these mean are uh, the calculated annuity amount, I say so total annuities. Um, so what this indicates that the total gross minus the applicable gross is greater than the total annuities that they found on the year-to-date deduction amount records. So again, this indicates a possible problem with your annuity amounts, gross and applicable gross. So again, you wanna go ahead and verify your adjustments and verify any manual adjustment updates that were made to year to date. Um, you might get an invalid social security number. Um, hopefully once the district goes through that process with the W-2 mates, um, that they won't have that problem. Um, the SSA defines series of social security numbers as invalid. So again, um, they might wanna verify to make sure it matches their social security card. Um, again, they can go to the employee and locate the employee and then update the social security number by clicking edit and just enter the correct social security number and then click save. And that will update that social security number if it is incorrect. Um, the next one is the Medicare amount does not equal that 1.45% of that Medicare gross. So again, um, you wanna make sure you verify that the Medicare tax was, um, is correct and verify all the amounts. So um, this error, I believe, will not accept if the incorrect amount. So they're gonna have to make sure this is corrected before they submit. Um, they wanna verify the manual adjustment updates um, that, any that were made. Um, they wanna make sure they check their Medicare pickup records. Again, they must have the 692 or 693 with their full employer amount is 2.9% if they're full. Um, another warning that uh, your districts might get is that negative annuity on file for this employee assuming zero. So what that means is just it's a total negative annuity um, in a case a check maybe was avoided from the prior calendar year or, or in, that, in this current year then. Um, again, run the payment transaction status report option. Um, and again, you can use the check um, register that we um, suggested earlier. Um, and again, um, zero amount of the annuity. And then if there is a correction to be made, they can do that on a W2C from the previous calendar year. But if they wanted to show on this year that it was held and refunded in this current calendar year, then they can just go to core adjustments and, and zero the annuity amount by entering a positive figure that um, with the, coincides with a negative figure. So they just have to find how much that um, payroll item is, enter a zero as a negative amount, and then that will wipe that um, payroll item out. And again, they will have to do the same thing under core adjustments, and they're gonna wanna increase the total gross amounts from the federal, Ohio, OSDI, and city, and only if that city honors it. Again, they will probably have to ask the city for that. So again, then that will show that this amount was withheld and refunded in this current calendar year. Um, we, we might get an info message on the pension pack, um, plan flag on the federal record is overriding the W-2 proc calculations. Excuse me. Um, I had a question about the previous screen. Okay. Um, in classic, it would automatically increase those totals, right? It's for the growth, if it was a uh, refund or. And from a prior calendar year? Yeah. Uh, no, Classic did the same thing. 
if it was from a prior calendar year, you would have to increase the totals also. Just, just the total growth, Andrea. Everything total growth. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I meant, yeah. I'm sorry. Total sure. growth. I'm sorry. So they would I just have to increase the total growth. Having to do that in classic, it would just automatically increase. And we said, okay, it's just going to tax this year, not last year. But you have to do, you, you have to increase it this in redesign? I believe it was the same in classic. You still had to do the total gross if you wanted to show that it was withheld and refunded in the current calendar year. You still had to do it in classic just as you do in redesign. I think I think if you don't update the total gross, you'll just get an error. It's just like a warning error. Yeah, but and they can leave it if they want. To. You don't yeah. have to do the total gross. You can leave it unchanged un, un if you want to, but it's just that you may get an error. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Um, on this one, the pension pack um, flag on the federal record is overriding W-2 calculations. Um, if the federal payroll item um, has a pension plan flag, there's no. Um, never check the pension plan box, um, but finds an active retirement record. You might get this um, info and message. Also, if the federal payroll item has it marked the pension plan flag, um, which is automatically check the pension plan box ba based on the retirement, or yes, check the pension box, pension plan box, but does not find an active retirement record. Um, again, this is just common to receive this, and this is informational. Again, this would be maybe for students who do not participate in search. And if you do get that, there's no action needed on those employees. Another info message they may receive is a payroll item, um, and then it'll list what the code number is, um, possible error on the OSCI gross or tax. Um, what this just indicates that the taxable OSCI wages, but there was no tax withheld. Again, this is just common informational for employees that maybe have a smaller wage amount um, per payroll. So just verify, make sure those amounts are correct and you know that there didn't have any tax withheld that that was correct. And then usually they don't need any more action on that one. So for the warning, um, federal total annuities does not equal total gross less applicable gross. Um, again, um, what this means is the calculated annuity amount, total gross less applicable, does not match the year to date annuity amounts from the payroll item. So again, the program compares what the total annuities from the payroll items to the total gross less applicable gross calculation. And what it is using is the federal tax record to get these figures. So again, there might be a problem with the, with the annuity total for that employee, maybe the total gross or maybe the applicable gross of that federal record. So again, verify, look at any adjustments for that employee and make the corrections. The federal total annuities do not equal total gross less equitable gross. Um, again, verify, like I said, any adjustments that were made, verify refund deductions. Um, that could be a possibility for that employee. Again, if the refund from the prior year can year, and again, if the district just wants that error to be removed, then they need to make adjustments. Again, that would then that increase total gross federal Ohio OSCI and city using the adjustment records, adjustment under core. Another error, uh, this employee's Medicare wages are less than their Social Security wages. Again, um, these have to be fixed, I believe, before they can submit. Oh, no, actually, they can go ahead and send that through. The Social Security Ministry will contact the district if the error is not fixed. So, again, they probably want to get those fixed. They're going to give a call. But um, so the Medicare gross wages amount is incorrect. Again, on the FICA gross wage amount, um, so go ahead and make sure that update that gross amount on the Medicare or the FICA payroll item for that employee um, that has an incorrect amount. Again, they can use the core adjustments. Um, here's a W-2 report. Um, the annuities calculated gross minus taxable gross. The re under report for tax withheld, taxable gross and total gross. These are all from the payroll items for each code. And then the special amounts for W-2. 
will show underneath the 001 under the descriptions. So um, last year we did have where the districts could start submitting their own, but if the ITCs are still submitting it for their districts, they still have that option, or if the ITCs want to um, submit, have their districts start submitting their own files and creating their own files for the W-2 report, and then the ITC just has to run the W-2s for them, um, create those. Um, again, what they want to do is go to the W-2 report submission and under here, under submission. And again, they're gonna make sure that all the information is filled in correctly, voter ID, if you have an additional federal ID, state ID, make sure your kind of employer is correct. Um, again, the district may have to ask if they don't know which one this is for the kind of employer. If the school district is part of a local government and has not applied for 501c status, and they're going to want to use the S, the state and local government employer. If the school has not has applied for the 501c status and was granted that nonprofit status, then they're going to want to use the Y, state and local tax employer exempt employer 501c. For the W-2 submission files, again, you have your option of what you want to sort your um, Sort the submission by, make sure you report year, um, the core, the names are actually defaulted from the organization. So that, that comes directly over, so they shouldn't have to change anything there. Um, again, the contact name is always going to be required, as you can see with the red, red um, dot here, and the phone number, and the contact email. Those two things are required also to be filled in. All right, so the W-2 report option then creates your SSA W-2 submission file, CCA submission file, and the RETA submission file. Under W-2 city, it's going to create your W-2 city submission file. So then once you get to that point where you want to create the submission files, you can go ahead and um, just create this SSA, CCA, and the RETA. Um, a new option has been added down here at the bottom. I believe it's, eh, where is it at? If they want to select the uh, by city tax entity code, um, as long as they have this filled out correctly in the payroll item configuration, they can use that code and actually um, create a W-2 report just for those employees that may be paid into that, um, like, 003 um, a payroll item. And they can do that for each city. So they can, they can verify and make sure all the um, employees are correct for each city um, before filing their city taxes. So that might be helpful for the districts to share um, so they can verify each city separately. Um, on the W-2 um, city tape file, you create that under the city options. Is this new option here, or I don't think it's new, but the, the tax entity code is required for W-2 city processing. So when they're, make sure that this is filled in for the tax entity code when they're creating the city file for each city. Um, they can add the option to include those amounts for all cities. On, on, on that record, or they can include the city name for that process, it includes city name for the processing city. So they have both of those options. And what those mean, if they check the include amounts for all cities to include all the amounts for all the cities, um, this was, this is, like I said, it's gonna include all the city amounts, but most cities wanna know um, all the other cities for the employer is, employee is being reported to. So again, um, they might have to check with the city if they want to include those other cities on that file. If they don't, then they can uncheck that. Um, the next one is to include city name for processing city. Um, this option will include other cities that the employees uh, pays into as well as they include the city name for the processing city that they're 
running that for. So again, when this box is checked, the system will check the payroll item configuration abbreviation box. Um, if it's blank, then the check, then it will check the W-2 abbreviation box and use that. And if that is blank, then it's gonna look at the payee city address. So you just wanna so verify. So just to clarify on that, mm -hmm. um, if we run the city and we don't, do we have to fill out that box for the city code if we're doing the multiple or only if we're only doing one city? Um, you have to fill it, you have to fill it out. On this one, you mean? Or yes. Oh uh, yeah, that, that, that is required. You can't get past. Okay, so when you're talking about tax entity code, is that per city? So if you have multiple yes. cities, how does yes. that work? You have you, to run it per city. Okay. You that, yeah, you have to run it per city for your for each city to be created because they have to they have to send those into each city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions on that city option? Okay. And then for the W-2 submission file continued, um, again, the W-2 state is going to create, um, you have each one separate that you have to create if your districts are have um, states that are um, against um, employees that work from other states. Um, you're going to have Ohio W-2 submission, Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and then the Pennsylvania has that extra CSV file. Again, if you don't have employees that are from these dis, um, other states, then you don't have to worry about running those. Just the ones that your um, districts have employees from. Um, again, to create that tape file, um, go ahead and click on that W-2 state button, and then you want to click on each um, state that is for your district that needs to be ran. Um, again, each state setup is unique. So like Pennsylvania, they have to have two files. They want to make sure they create both of those. Um, Indiana, they have a 10-digit taxpayer ID with a three-digit TID location. Again, you're going to have to get that information from Indiana if they don't so already. And that is right here down at the bottom. For West Virginia, they have a, um, where they have to fill out um, on the W-2, they have to fill in this federal quarter. So they probably will get that from a form that they've been keeping track at the district and they have to fill those in and, and it has to be rounded to the whole dollar and then enter the total amount here. Again, that is just for West Virginia. So then uh, moving on to the XML. So um, this is the, what is going to be used to create their W-2s. So when they choose an XML, here, XML right down here. And again, you would fill in the information just like you were when you're running the report or the submission file. Make sure you have everything included um, that you wanna add for your um, 14 box 14. And you wanna generate the XML output file. And again, what this file is gonna be used for is to print the W2s um, from the Edge software. And again, um, even if your district is creating this own their their own file, or the IFU with HC is doing this for them, um, either way, um, you guys have to print them as of right now. But I believe we are working on trying to get that where the districts can only actually print that and print their own W-2s. So now the district submitting 2021 W-2 reporting and submission. So if the district is uh, going to create their own W-2s in submission. What they need to do is go to W-2 configuration and check the district will submit own W-2. Down here and at the bottom. And I already had it clicked, so you probably saw extra boxes at the bottom. Um, the district will um, submit own W-2. So here is the information that they got to make sure they have this checked. And they're going to want to make sure all this information is filled out. And when you submit the submitter um, 
submit name and address, same as, com as company. If they click this, they don't have to fill this in again. It automatically fills that in for them. So they don't have to redo that. So that's nice, it just copies it. So they wanna make sure this is all filled out. Um, if they don't have it filled out correctly, um, we have a error set up in place. So when you save, it's not gonna let you move on. So we, that is something that we just added to. So each time you, if, if you're forgetting something, it's going to ask you um, for that information and you'll get an error up here. I have to add this back in, save it out. That if I remember everything. Yeah, and even if like the email address, um, it's even actually um, looks at the email, so it, they can't even enter an, an email address that is wrong. So I think this is going to save some heartache for districts when they don't have the information correctly set up. There we go. So again, um, if, if, this, if this information is um, missed, um, like I said, it's not gonna let them save it. And they will get information or that's error of above and they just have to follow that. And again, if they have questions, they can figure out why it's doing that, just contact us and we can help you with that. And I just uh, create or just put in here what, make sure what the districts need to fill out in order for that to um, be able to save. So then what this does then is let um, creates a couple of different reports that we're not showing when the district was just um, creating the option reports and submission files. Um, now they have a submission file summary report uh, under each one. That is something different when they have that box checked. And what it will create, what it's called is a w2mass.txt for SSA, w2mass uh, CCA text for CCA, and the file is called w2mass Rita that text for the Rita file. Um, again, I had gone through this WC um, city options. So this option prints the separate reports for the city taxes. If they wanna make sure they need to send a report to, to maybe the um, cities with their different, um, just for that city, we have that option now. And it will only print anybody that with 004. Now, if the employees have like two different cities, 003 and 004, it's gonna include, it's gonna show that 003 on there also. Um, so they can't, we can't um, break that out of there. So here's an example of uh, the W2 City tape that I created through for the OL4. And as you can see, it's just employees. I have the OL4 listed on the file. And then also it's just employee totals so they can maybe do a balancing if they need to um, on that. Um, the other thing for the W-2 city option, um, they wanna make sure that they entered that tax entity code. Um, again, I had included that earlier um, for each city that they're creating. And then what they get is also another um, down here at the bottom, W-2 submit, um, city submission file summary report. And that's just gonna show um, that uh, file um, summary of the totals. And it's called W-2 city, I don't know why it's way down here. There we go, bring you back up. W2 city underscore, and then it'd be the, I believe the entity code, and then the tax, and the dot tax. That's what that form will be. For the W2 state, again, you're gonna have a W2 state um, submission file, W2 mass underscore Ohio. That's what this summary, uh, file summary report will be. You're going to have your file W2 uh, summary for W2 Mass, W2 summary for um, Kentucky, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and for West Virginia. For the W2 SSA submission file summary, um, here's an example of that. It shows um, the employees, uh, how many employees, and the totals. And then it actually breaks down Medicare, tax withheld, dependent care, Medicare wages, FICA. 
Um, w-2 instructions, if you have specific details um, for the 2021 W reporting requirements, um, again, we included the website here that they can, um, if they have questions. For the corrections on page 26, they can find this. This is a uh, use W-2C form. Um, if they have a W-3C form that they must uh, accompany with the W-2C form when they're doing this. And make sure the form is the correct totals um, submitted on the tape file by the IETC. And if they have an incorrect address, um, this WTC form is not required for anything that is incorrect for an address. For the deceased employee wages, again, that's page eight. If you have instructions, um, any questions on that, we do have that included, I believe, on our wiki with that. If not, it's underneath our appendix on our documentation. Again, if the payment is made uh, in the year the employee died, uh, W-2 reporting is required and a 1099. But if the employee a payment was made a year after the death employee, then only a 1099 is required. For designated Roth IRAs, this is on page eight. Edu educational assistance, they can find that on page nine. And again, if they have any questions on that, they can contact their legal advisor. For the employee business expense reimbursements, they can find this on page nine. Oh, got it. Oh, there we go. Um, employee taxes paid by employer, that would be on page nine through 16. And that's for the Medicare pickup. If they have any questions on fringe benefit, page 10. Group life insurance, that would be fine on page 10 also. For the health savings, the HSA, page 11. And that gives instructions for the forms of W-2 and W-3. And then the lost W-2, that can be found on page 11. And again, they can do a hand type new form and enter reissue statement on the new copy. The moving expense, um, that is on page 11. Third party sick pays, page 13. Page 15, um, instructions for W-2 and W-3 for box A. Box B and box C is found on 16, letter I-E-I-N, and the employer information is entered on W-2 PROC. Boxes E and F is found on 16. That's the employee's name and address in box E and F. And this data comes from file screen and classic that comes from your employee screen. Box one is wages from the federal tax gross amount. And then box two, um, this is found on page 17, and this is the tax withheld from the federal record um, year to date amount. Um, the box three comes from the 692, 693 social security wages um, that is flagged correctly as a payroll item social security. For box four, this is found on page 17, and this is the social security taxes that was withheld from 692, 693 records and flagged as the social security tax. On box five, this would be your Medicare wages, um, 692, 693 records that were flagged as payroll item Medicare. For box six, this is the Medicare taxable wages, 692. And that's Medicare, uh, payroll item Medicare. And then box 10 is your dependent care benefits that were entered through the, your adjustments on the o, um, um, federal record 001. Um, your box 12 codes, this would be your code C, uh, group term life insurance, your code D, deferrals of your 401k, code E would be your 403B salary, code F is your section 408. 408k6. Code G is your 457b deferred compensation plan. Code H is your 501c 18d tax exempt organization plan. Code J is your non taxable sick pay that you um, would have entered through adjustments. Your code P is your excludable moving expense. Again, this is only for armed forces. And then code T, um, adoption benefits. And code W is the employer contributions to the health savings account employer contributions. 
And again, this is including the Section 125 annuity amounts that the employee contributed to that Section 125. Uh, the code AA is for the 401k. The code BB is your 403b, designate Roth contributions. Code DD is your the employer sponsor health coverage. The code uh, EE is your designated Roth contributions on the government, 457b. And the code FF is the um, employer qualified small employer health or reimbursement arrangement. And again, um, the max reimbursement is $53.50 and the family is $10,700. For box 13, this is your retirement plan, 401A, K, 403B, 408K, and 501C18. For box 14, again, this would be those um, the three that you have entered when you're um, entering the W-2, um, creating the W-2 um, form or reports. Um, again, the, the vehicle, if the play is vehicle, that's always going to show uh, COVID-19 then, and then any other and deductions that were under, under W-2 prop. So it's always going to be these three first, if they have those, and then anything optional possibilities they can include, union dues, retirement, um, pretty much up to the district what they want to enter in that, the show. W-3 form. Um, again, this is not required now unless you're filing by paper and probably a lot of districts don't do that anymore. Um, so w, totals on the W-2 submission file created by W-2 um, report um, is a substitute for the W-3 form now. Again, if you have corrections before files have been submitted to the SSA, um, if, you have, if the district has not sent that in yet, then they can make your corrections and regenerate a, a new W-2 submission file. But if they already had submit, submitted that in, um, then they're going to have to do the scenario of the W-2C and W-C-3 will have to be submitted by the districts. Um, preparing for 2022, again, if you enter changes in the tax withholding, you can start this um, effective January 1st, 2022. Again, we included the link for the city rates and the OSDI city or the OSDI rates. We included the links here for you. Um, another thing for CCA re, uh, city rates, um, you can start looking to make sure that probably uh, new rates may be able to be coming in for 2022 and to make sure you check those new tables. Um, and again, um, we suggest reviewing these sites even now because um, sometimes they can do a quick update before they before you complete your W-2 processing. Um, maybe they changed it over um, a new uh, city, went on to RETA late in the year um, or went into CCA. So always check those and make sure any of your cities uh, maybe have changed over and you did not catch that. Unsure if employees should be taxed. Again, we included those um, URLs here for you for um, the city and the school district. Um, again, you can look up tax rates once you get to these URLs by address of the employee, maybe the zip codes um, or the latitude or longitude. Uh, mass changing payroll items rates um, for the new coming year. Um, they can use mass change or mass load. Of using mass load, um, you want to go to the custom report creator. They can select the object, annuity item, regular item, city tax, whatever needs to be made or changed and then choose the fields you want to include on your file and then configure the, configure the filters. So um, to include just to uh, display the code name, op operation um, equals, and then do a filter for that specific configuration code. And you wanna make sure your format is Excel and then click generate report. And again, you can make any necessary changes then to that um, um, report that you created to the new tax rate and then cha change it to CSV when you save as. And then go ahead under utilities mass load and select your CSV file. And then make sure you, you click the importable entity, which is payroll item now. It doesn't have like uh, where you have to click uh, annuity, regular OSDI. It's all under one now and click load. If using mass change, um, go to payroll item configuration. Um, again, you want to make sure you filter out what um, 
object code that you're going to be doing, um, like um, OSDI or annuity, um, then filter the code um, of what you're looking for if you don't do um, the separate um, annuity at the top left, which I was talking about. Uh, So you can select each one if it makes it easier. If you need to change something for annuity, you can just select annuity and then enter the code. So it, um, like 32, and then it just brings up those people for that mass change. So that's another option to do. Enter the new value then, and then once you do that, you can do your mass change. And then um, enter in the, under the script, choose rate. Enter the new value. Um, you can enter a def on definition um, name and click save. Um, now select the execution mode. And then under the definition, um, you want to go ahead and select the um, definition that you created, the rate change of 501. And then you want to click the submit mass change. So you can either create it in a spreadsheet and load in, or excuse me, load in the definition that you created by going here and download the definition, or you can just go here, select rate, and enter in the new amount, and then execution. And just verify, make sure if you know the, the amount or the number of people that you're changing, just make sure that looks correct here. And again, um, this is kind of like a data tree and classic who are familiar with that. We kind of consider that the same. Um, so the, we suggest maybe the ITC perform these mass changes and um, if the district is not very used to using mass change because it can probably um, make a mess if they don't do it correctly. Okay, um, I am through this PowerPoint. Um, I have another one, but I know I see we're going on an hour and a half already. So I didn't know um, if anybody had any questions on W-2 um, processing, because that's what I was going to go through kind of again. Um, we do have a, I think I believe, a review on December 10th of W-2 submission procedures um, that we can go through then a little bit more um, if, they, if we need to. Does anybody have any questions? Andrea, I have a yes. question. Um, sure. If the district creates all of their W-2 files, their um, the print file, all of that, that will be put in the file archive so that we as an ITC can go to the file archive and get the files from there in order to print their W-2s instead of having to go through Contact and create them. the process. Yes, I do believe that is correct. When they, I'm pretty when they sure that's what we did last yeah. year. Yeah, and it goes right over to file archive, and then they can find that in the um, either I, I can't remember if it's year end or exactly what it's um, located under. Let me check here. It would be calendar year end. I'm wondering. These are I don't have up to date files. Yes. Okay, so if they created the XML, it would be there also. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. Okay, I wanted to make sure that that didn't change the, we had to start creating those XML files ourselves because we don't know how they answered all of their questions. Okay, gotcha. So if they create it, um, yes, that, that should all go out to the file archive when they when they create those. So you should, you should be able to just go ahead and pull those right directly from there. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm looking just to make sure. There it is, W-2. Yeah, W-2 form um, data XML. Perfect, thank you. And if you have any questions on what is um, an, uh, created when they do that W-2, um, it's under our utilities and file archive. And you'll find that under payroll archive report bundles. And that breaks down what what gets created when they do certain um, things in the system. 
Um, that was a good question. Any other questions on that? Andrea, this is Deb Denon. Hi. Um, I have an unrelated question. Okay. About um, the change that ODJFS is doing from Eric to oh, the yes. source. Oh, yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, um, we, uh, I believe classic, uh, the changes are ready for classic. They just have to, um, um, do a release on that and we're working on redesign right now. And those will be in, um, in place, uh, probably middle of December. Okay. Before they and file you, their last you know ODGFS. That, requires that, uh, districts get and, and us, if we do it for them, um, if we have to do anything to get user access or if they're going to take what we have for Eric and we don't have to do anything. <laughs> I'm, sorry, what was that? Knew anything. I'm sorry, what was that question? Uh, as far as our a login to source, if we have to apply or register for another one or if the Eric stuff will, uh, our Eric profile will be just automatically in source. If anybody's done any more checking on that? That I'm not certain on their side of things, but we um, they might want to call Eric um, and see if there's anything more they have to do on that. Let's see. If they have to get a new content, I wouldn't think they would have to, but again, they might want to check with them. If they're switching that over where the districts have to get different login requirements for that. I was hoping not, but I, I don't know how that works. I thought maybe somebody did more research than I did. It looks but like thank you. put something in the chat on that. Oh, did they? I know about the switch this morning. Did that email come from ODGFS or the ERIC, I'm assuming, to ITCs? Yes, Is that what it was, Kelly? Okay. Yeah, I got an email from um, the ODGFS system this morning. It, it's from the source at jfs.ohio.gov. Okay. So it just talks about the accounts and what you have to do um, to still continue to submit for more than one entity. Okay. All right. Great. So that email yeah. should have went I can forward that to you, Deb just in case you didn't get it. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, is there any other questions? And like I said, we're gonna have a, on December 12th, I'm doing, or December 10th, I'm doing a review of W2 submissions. Um, so I can go in more detail there about um, more things on, but I, I, I try to hit most of that on our PowerPoint here with oh, the COVID and everything. Question. I'm sorry? Andrea, we've got a question. Sure. Can you show us that city entity option again? I know Mark and the SSDT on the W-2 report and submission page. Um, I, I didn't see it on the, um, I know there's different radio buttons there. And I know it's at the bottom on this one, which is the report, but can you scroll up back to the top and click on the submission? Or the, sure. I'm sorry, XML, XML button, I'm sorry. And I don't think the city entity is at the no. bottom of this. That is correct. On the forms. So can correct. you go back and switch to forms now, please, for us? Sure. Perfect. Okay, great. Because this is what a lot of our districts that have to do paper submissions, this is going to be so much easier for them. Okay, um, great. This is like so they have 15 to 25. Now they can just search by them and get forms that they can submit to those entities without having to do, or without the ITCs having to go through accountability to create those separate files. So thank you, Andrea, for taking the time to show us that. Oh, not a problem. Is there any other questions on here that we wanna see at the moment? Okay. Um, okay, um, then I will save my other PowerPoint uh, for um, 
that I was going to go into more detail of the W-2. Um, and we'll wait and do that on the tent since I'm running like an hour and a half in. But we hit the most of the crucial points here in this PowerPoint. Um, and I will, and Andrew, I will definitely uh, look into that fringe benefit side, the taxable benefit for that one, that district you have for that employee um, and make sure um, that is, um, they get that corrected or submitted correctly. Okay, um, I think we have everything covered um, as of right now. I will go ahead, we'll go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll, we'll come back maybe like 10.35 um, and Pat will do the USAS side. And thank you very much and please enjoy your um, weekend. Thank you. I'm ready if everybody else is ready. We're good to go. Okay, thank you. So I'll be covering the USAS section today for calendar year end. And again, under the meetings and training page, you can find the materials for redesign over here with USAS on the left and USPS on the right. Um, you can also find it in the appendix for the checklists for USAS under appendix checklist. You can go to the calendar year end checklist um, okay, so we'll just jump into the PowerPoint. Unmute yourself and ask any questions. If you're wondering about something, I'm sure somebody else is um, wondering the same question, so don't be shy. I sometimes don't see the chat all the time, so just speak up or somebody will notify me about the chat. So today we will be discussing the steps that you can do now for 1099 preparation, as well as the month end checklist and the calendar year end um, closing checklist. And then we'll look at the procedures for processing and submitting the 1099s as well. So the first thing you can do for USAS preparation year end is to be informed. This is a snapshot of the publication 1220 and you'll see there's some a section here with the um, what's new for tax year 2021. Some of the new things is um, the application for the TCC, which is a transmitter um, control code that districts need. They're going to submit the file to the IRS themselves. That is now an online application. You'll also wanna be aware of the due dates and the 1099 NEC form, which is the non-employee compensation form is now part of the combined federal and state reporting program. Whereas last year it was not. So that's another new thing. And then you'll see the record formats, which um, the development team will update those in the software. So again, Know your due dates. This way you can plan any processing and printing while allowing time for districts to meet their deadlines as well as your deadlines. The filing of the non-employee compensation form is um, due electronically or on paper, but most of you are probably doing it electronically, um, January 31st, 2022. And you'll also want to send a copy of the form to your vendors or independent contractors by that due date as well. The miscellaneous form is filed with the to the with is filed to the IRS electronically by March 31st. And those recipients of the form should also receive a copy by January 31st. So um, we're not here to advise, but if I were you, I would just do it all at once and get it done with by January 31st. So 1099 submission by the district, again, they'll need that five digit transmitter code that's required for that um, process. And like I said, there was an online application. Here's the link for that. Now that form that was used prior, 4419, can still be used for existing 
um, districts that have the TCC number, but only to update the name and the contact name. So basically it's an online form from here on out. And then for more information about um, that, I provided the link there too. So another, this is one of the things that they could be doing now prior to year end. Because before the first submission of the combined federal and state reporting program, they'll want to submit a test file too. And here is um, instructions on how to create the test file. It's um, basically following this, the normal TR-1099 and submission instructions, except for these exceptions. And then once they receive an approval level letter or email from the IRS, then they can update the TCC number into the system. The FIRE system is the filing information returns electronically with the IRS. And they, of course, are always limited in their window of availability. I did provide a link here to, for you to check for any updates. Um, this is the information as it was when I was preparing this PowerPoint. So between these dates, the system is down for their annual updates. So you won't be able to submit a test file or um, go on to their system. And then it'll become available on January 7th. Now the test availability, again, it is, no, um, no longer down for updates because it's past that date. So now the system is available up until December 3rd. So again, that's something that they could be doing now if needed. Another thing that could be um, now is to get acquainted with the usage of the 1099 forms, who should be receiving which form and um, information about that. Now, up until this year, the 1099 miscellaneous form was actually called miscellaneous income. And from um, this year beyond, it's now called miscellaneous information. And you can see I provided another link for the IRS website regarding the 1099 forms and publications. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. All right, so another thing you can do before year end is to review and verify your vendors, such as the vendor tax ID type, which is the social security number or the employer identification number. You'll want to review the vendor ID to verify that it's correct and that um, is the actual number. And you'll want to make sure that the right vendors, um, the vendor type 1099 is identified. And these include non-employee, non-1099, um, attorney gross proceeds, royalties, rents, other income, or medical and healthcare. Those are the types. And then you can also verify the vendor's 1099 location, which is the address that you'll be sending the information to. You'll find all this information on the vendor's record under core vendors. If you need to update or change any of these details, you would do so in these sections on the vendor record. There's a 1099 section, which includes um, the checkbox to ignore limits if you choose to do so. This is a drop down to choose between uh, social security number or the EIN number. Here is where you enter the number. And this is the drop down for the different types that I listed like rents, royalties, medical payments, attorney gross proceeds, and et cetera. Um, Pat, before yes. we on, there was a question in the chat and actually, no, I'm just gonna say, I'm sorry. I, I read your question wrong. So Pat, I'm not sure if you know this. Um, I just wanted to stop so we could suggest or so we could discuss. But she's asking um, how long it takes for the district to get back the approval letter or email once they submit the test file. Um, I answered there, but I was thinking not the test file, but like applying for the account. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure. Um, 
I think I don't I'm know sure either. Has an estimate. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else, you know, has submitted a test file. You know, I don't know that we have that information, but maybe figured I kind of hop on and discuss it verbally in case anybody else might have uh, submitted a test file and have an idea. Okay. Well, if anybody does, feel free to share that in the chat. I think the other way to um, maybe get an answer to that question would be um, to see if the IRS website has any sort of estimate regarding the testing files. And then if anybody finds out, um, please feel free to share like on the touch base wave meetings that are every other week as well to share with your colleagues. And again, I'm just, I'm so sorry, I jumped again and uh, totally was thinking about something else there. So apologies on that in the chat. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, it was the TCC number. When they get, I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, Pat, but I see Ashley responded and said it's the first year having the district get the TCC number. That is what I'm thinking about. When they apply for their own account, that's what um, I, I was thinking of. And that's what took at least a couple of weeks. So um, I'd have them apply ASAP. Any other questions? Okay, so on the vendor record, again, we went over the 1099 section, but there's also the location tab down below that you can designate the 1099 address, which can either be the same as the PO or check address, but it does not have to be. Um, the 1099 name and address should come from the W-9 collected from the vendor. And this is where you would separate the 1099 location that may be different from the PO and the check location. I was just giving you an example there. And then if you remember in the classic software, you could indicate the 1099 name in the second name, 1099 Denise Davis. Um, so we advise all districts that are processing 1099s and the redesign for the very first time to review these records for accuracy. Make sure the second name is not included in with the 1099 prefix that came over in the redesign. So there are um, several options to review 10, 1099 data. Um, you can use the vendors grid under core vendors. You can use the SSDT 1099 vendor report, or you can use um, the 1099 extracts report that is found under the periodic menu. And we'll review all of these, but they can be used interchangeably but some may be more helpful in different points of the process. For example, it's um, to use the vendor grid. It might uh, be more convenient to use the vendor's grid when you're updating the information. And then it might be more advantageous to use the 1099 vendor report um, to run throughout the year as a double check of your vendors. Or you can use, like I said, you could use the 1099 extract report to verify all information prior to even creating the tape file, which you would do under the same uh, menu option. So first starting with the vendors grid and using the more button, you can pull this information onto your grid to review and verify. So for example, you would pull in the tax ID type Make sure the ID number is on your grid and the type to um, verify your 1099 information. You can also pull in your default 1099 location to verify your name and address. And then remember, you can always um, use the report bunder button on the grid to save your uh, and run a report. So here's an example of the vendor's grid um, that I pulled in all the information and I filtered it just to show one, but if I didn't have a filter here, it would show all your vendors um, and all your types. And then that way you can start filtering these um, 
different fields for your verification or for the district's verification. And again, you can also re generate a report from the vendor grid details in order to save. And if you're, while you're verifying this information or is the district's verifying this information, if they're unsure whether a social security number or EIN number should be used, um, I would suggest to them to look at the W-9 form collected from the vendor. Um, they can also utilize the IRS interactive TIN program, which is like the name and TIN matching program. This is totally optional, but this program allows one um, to enter up to 25 names and the tax ID number and get immediate results. And here's an example of the vendor report with all your information. And you also want to verify your 1099 data to ensure you capture everybody that should be getting the form or to ensure that somebody isn't on that list to get a form when they shouldn't be getting the form. So to identify all your 1099 vendors and all the um, non-1099 vendors, as well as their type and qualifying year-to-date taxable total. So you can pull that in on the grid too, sort by active vendors. Um, you can, your taxable total, you can do greater or equal to the limit, which is $600. This, um, you can probably see it here better, that um, those carrots, Will, ex will filter and exclude any non-1099 1099 type. So that means um, to filter out those. And again, you can uh, use the report button to print or save your filtered grids so that you can use this report in the future as well. And so when you're on this grid, you can, like, I'm just showing that you can um, filter by the R for royalties, the A for um, this type for attorney gross proceeds. There's various uh, ways that you can filter for, to pull your information in order to verify it. Sometimes districts are too big and the grid will give you ex excess error. So then I would advise using the advanced query button and you can pull the same information from the properties on the left over to your um, advanced query grid. So here I have active vendors equals true. The same kind of filters I had on the grid, but this is um, this will allow more result. So the, here I have the type of 1099 not equal to um, non-1099, so that'll exclude those that group, and then the taxable total greater or equal to 600. Now here you can save your query, and I called it 1099 vendors. And so if I had saved this last year, I can just come in here this year and use this drop down to pull my 1099 vendor query that I saved last year. So then once you have this set up, you apply query and your results would be down in the grid, but more filtered, and it would not give you that excess error. So uh, this is an example of filtering out on your grid for non 1099 vendors. And you can use the grid for the advanced query as well. And then another option is to actually use SSDT 1099 vendor report. And here you see the sections are totaled. So non-employee compensation total for your vendors listed separately, your medical 1099, your royalty payments, if any, and your attorney gross proceeds.
I'm lost in my notes, so just a moment. Okay, so this report is often used um, useful like throughout the year just to double check and keep an eye on the 1099 vendor um, info. And you can see that it shows the taxable total and the year to date total, which they are most likely going to match. Um, but if a they're usually the same, but they may be different if a vendor was paid an amount that doesn't belong on a 1099. And in that case, a vendor adjustment may be necessary. And I'll show you that in a moment. By default, the, the report includes all the vendor types. But you can configure the vendor report and modify the um, your filters to include either specific types or um, the as of period, whatever you want to configure, you have the ability to um, create your report. So the other option, which is probably going to be used more now through the end of the year, is to use the 1099 extract report which is under the um, periodic menu and also creates the extract file in the same area. Now, this can be used to verify data without creating the um, extract file. And it does default to exclude vendors without no tax ID, but you can uncheck that. Oops, I'm sorry. You'll want to select the drop down year 2021, and that will not show a 2021 in the drop down unless your December posting period has been created. So, once December posting period is created, that'll allow you to drop down and select um, 2021. You can run the type of return either by both or just by one. The output file type is actually whether, um, I think I had that on a slide somewhere, but the output file type is actually whether it's the um, IRS format or the, um, the form. Again, remember I said, if those two amounts should not be the same, um, the total or the year to date taxable total, then you can do a manual adjustment under the vendor. Click on vendor adjustments. Create a new adjustment under that vendor. Here it's Leary Landscaping. Enter the adjustment um, with as much description so you remember what it was for in the future and the amount to be adjusted and then post. Are there any questions right now? Before I go on to the month end closing. had said something about um like kind of like the old tin match like they could enter 25 names how do they do that in redesign or do they have to go to like the irs website they do okay they do. there's not an option through the redesign but the irs website does allow you to enter that like oh. interactively do you know what it's called again i'm sorry i didn't grab the name what you had said um it's <sighs> Let me see if I, I think it was the TIN slash name matching program. Okay, I'll go look. It's okay. You, I just wanted, I didn't know if you had said it or if I was just thinking it because I was remembering that I wanted to ask a question about it. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I thank you. I'll make a note to add that link next year on the PowerPoint too. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so now you guys are at the point of month end closing. 
and you can um, ensure that all your transactions for the current month is entered, your interest, everything that needs to be. You can attempt to reconcile your USAS records with your bank. Um, I, the link is actually attached to the checklist. I didn't um, attach it here, but in the checklist, there is a link to the bank reconciliation procedure, which you can find under the periodic menu and you would select cash reconciliation and enter the information for the month. Thank you. Um, I see that Stephanie shared that link for the TIN matching program. So you can find that in the chat. So next you'll want to ensure that your records are balanced and you'll want to generate the SSDT cash summary report versus the SSDT financial detail report in order to compare the month to date totals on the cash summary versus the detailed reports on the other one. The totals should match. And if they match, you're in good shape and you can proceed because you're balanced. When the user closes a period, the monthly archive report bundle will run, but they might also want additional reports at calendar year end, like the spending plan report. This is optional, but many users will run this. Um, they can run the, um, any other reports manually as well. These are the normal um, monthly reports that will be populated into the bundle or into the archive. There are currently 27 reports that will automatically go to the file archive. But again, if you want additional reports, make sure you run them before closing out the month of December. Um, I would advise waiting until the bundle is complete before closing another month. But again, you'll probably only be closed in December. If you do not want the report bundle to run for the posting period, again, you can uncheck to disable the bundle. Um, individual reports in the file archive cannot be deleted, but you can delete the entire monthly bundle and then reclose if, if you need to be or you can save all your reports in the file archive and just sort by going to the top of the row by date and you'd have your current reports at the top. And users may wanna generate additional calendar year and reports as well. Um, the proration utility program, is often used to help generate a spreadsheet, which can be used in calculating and prorating like premium amounts from the Ohio Workers Compensation um, Bureau. So by doing that, I'll show you an example. You once, you would choose your time period, calendar year to date, you do have to have this account filter set up first, and that would be setting up the account filters for all objects of one parentheses parentheses, so all 100s. You can now have the option to run it by appropriation by checking it. And then you'll want to uh, file name there so it's saved. I will be reviewing this on the, um, December 3rd, uh, new releases on how to use this because now you can download this to modify the spreadsheet, but you can also create a PO, a PO CSV file in order to import it and turn this spreadsheet that you prorated. If this is the payment for the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation, 
here's our, oops, these are the prorated amounts, which can be used with a mapping and be converted into a purchase order. So on December 3rd, on that Fridays with Fiscal, I'll be demonstrating that in the, um, in the presentation. I'll get more in detail with that. So then once all the 1099, 1099 data is the districts will want to run the 1099 extracts option under the periodic menu. And the user will choose the XML file to, for printing the 1099s with the Edge software program. And then the output file type is the IRS format is the tap or the tape file. If that's chosen, this will be used for the IRS submission. And in a moment, I'll show you how these screens will be different under the 1099 extract. Just a note, when districts choose to generate the 1099 submission file, like if they run their file for 1099 NEC separately than the 1099 miscellaneous, then they'll want to make sure they have a different output file name here. This is a general um, outline of the calendar year and process. You'll want to print the forms using the 1099 XML file. Your districts should send a secure email to you with the XML file if they're processing it. Um, containing the 1099 forms to be printed. You will upload the um, file, which again, like the USPS side, you can pull these from the archive files so that you can print them with the edge software on the self-sealing laser forms. The 1099s are then run through the envelope sealer to seal the forms. Then the submission takes process or takes the submission process takes place to submit to the IRS. This can either be done with the district or the ITC. If the ITC submits, the district will need to send you a secure email with the I, to the ITC with the tap file. You will file transfer that formatted. Um, tape file created and redesigned over to the VMS side to amend and submit. And we'll go over that in a moment. You'll want to create a new posting period for January. And then you'll close December by clicking the file folder to close the December posting period. When they do that, the monthly report archives will be generated with those 27 um, monthly reports. And then the calendar year end report archive will also generate. And then the district is closed. So the calendar year archive can be found next to the monthly and fiscal. I believe this is new at the end of last year. Um, when the 1099 extract file is generated under the periodic menu, the files will be stored under this um, archive. And these are the files that would, if appropriate, would be um, stored under here. So you'll have your XML files that you can grab for, from the districts to print. You'll have um, these for submission. If the district is submitting to the IRS themselves, they'll have the transmitter report, which is a PDF, and you'll have these two reports as well. I would suggest um, recommending, or I would recommend putting an extra step on your checklist to the districts, just for them to verify that these files are actually in here, so that when you're ready to pull them for printing, they're actually there. So then when December is closed, um, so these files 
will populate under here when this is generated. And also under that tab, when December is closed, these reports will be generated and placed into that calendar archive um, area as well. So then each district, you'll want to give them a vendor copy of the Time 99 NEC forms, as well as the 1099 miscellaneous forms. You'll want to give them the district copies of both um, types of forms, as well as instructions on how to distribute them. I did include um, what the 2021 NEC form looks like similar to last year. Um, I think it was just more condensed, if I remember right. I think this is uh, like a smaller condensed form so you can get more on the page, if I recall. So this form would be used for any payments of $600 or more for non-employees and any attorneys. Non-employee compensation is reported in box one. Just a note, there is no automatic extension for this form. Um, the, the request is paper form and it would have to, um, I provided where you can find that, the paper form 8809 refer to part A. And then any corrections from prior years of course, you would put on the prior year form. So the miscellaneous income, 1099 miscellaneous income form was revised and now is called the miscellaneous information. And again, um, this the more common examples for this would be any gross proceeds to an attorney. And then sometimes deceased Employee wages are required by the IRS to be reported on a 1099, and this would be reported in the other income of box three. Um, box 10 would be the gross proceeds paid to an attorney. And um, if any of these other applicable boxes, I listed where they would be found on here. So to submit to the IRS electronically, the IRS fire system is used. And with the redesigned software, the ITC can submit the data on behalf of the district, or the district now has the ability to submit their own data to the IRS using the redesigned software. And again, just a reminder, when the data is submitted, the, um, the oh, the 1099, or, sorry. When submitting the data electronically, the IRS 1096 transmitter form is not required. We do recommend that the ITC set a deadline with the districts to allow time to print um, and then return the forms to the districts so that they can mail or distribute the forms, as well as um, the time it takes to like append and combine the classic and redesign files so that if the ITC is submitting, you have time to you know, combine those and submit, as well as the submission. So when the 1099 fi files are submitted to the IRS by the district, the district, again, must have that TCC code from the IRS, and this will be entered in the redesign under system configuration, and then the IRS form 1099 submission configuration. This is the current look and what you saw last year, and the district would just enter their TCC code but we received feedback and the enhancement is gonna be on the next release. It'll look like this. So this is the JIRA issue. It's 
scheduled for this release and the required fields will now populate. So instead of the configuration screen looking like just this, um, it'll look like this. The district will choose um, whether or not they'll submit the file to IRS and then a TCC number can be filled in and then the required fields will be generated from this configuration. So it'll automatically populate when you go to um, run your 1099 extract. So that's the new look. Um, once the IRS form 1099 submission configuration has been set up, um, you will have to fill out additional fields um, if the district is submitting. So they'll have to, and I have a screenshot here. These are the fields that came over automatically from the configuration that's gonna be released on the next release. So by now setting up that up under the configuration menu, the required fields of these are now populated. So that's nice. But they will still have to check mark this if applicable or uncheck mark that if applicable and choose the submission type, whether it's original, whether it's a correction or whether it's a test. But other than that, the required fields are now populated. So this is by district. And if the ITC, you see there's less fields because you'll be taking this extract file and combining it with the other um, files for the other districts. So this is what the menu option is gonna look like if the ITC submits the file. And again, it's the same found under the periodic 1099 extracts. There is no configuration setup necessary like for the TCC code. Um, it's the same options except for these fields, like the name, the email, the submission type. And then it may be helpful under here as ITCs are running this um, to change this name to distinguish like the district files. So I put that you could reference the PowerPoint for classic calendar year, which will also be next week. Um, we'll have that recording out there after next week's training, but you'll want to use the classic TR-1099 program to create the formatted file if the ITC is submitting it to the IRS. So the ITC should create one file appending all the district's classic and redesigned um, TAP files into one single file. I listed the um, files that are created in classic. And then creating the append command, uh, we recommend the classic tape files be entered before the redesigned tape files. There are various formats of the append command, but here's one example of what you would enter to append all the files together. And if you have any questions, please just let us know. Again, you can probably reference the PowerPoint on the classic for more information and join us for next Friday's PowerPoint. But you'll run the TR-1099 program and enter um, the appended file name, the output file name, the TIN, and the rest of the information. And then you'll receive the TXT summary report, which we recommend keeping it on site and saving it. And then the output file to submit 
and you'll be submitting that through the IRS fire system. Um, the ITC will be submitting that to the IRS fire system. You can see instructions under Part B, IRS Publication 1220 for um, instructions. I provided a link here for the fire system and where you'll upload the file that's created in TR 1099. And you'll want to make sure you keep a copy of that transmitter file and report for your records. Now in redesign, when the district's doing it, um, this is another upcoming JIRA issue. So I put the JIRA issue up here and it should be on the next release. But now the district that's submitting the files to the IRS will get this um, transmitter report with totals, totals by each type and total number of payees, which was uh, feedback from you guys last year. So that's what it should look like, if not similar. Some other upcoming JIRA issues that I included. Um, oh, and here I had a typo that I'll fix on the meetings and training page. I just referenced the wrong slides. The, this is actually the correct slides. And what I was showing you was this old screen versus what that's gonna look like. So I had the, um, the number of the slide wrong. So the required fields will be populated from the configuration. Um, USAS R 4495. If there'll be no submission file created if there are no miscellaneous vendors um, included. 4493 will remove any special characters like the dashes, like when a user would enter a TIN number or a social security number and they use a dash, it'll, the system will now remove that dash or any other special character before um, creating that 1099 extract. And then 4480 will restrict USAS read only and USAS rec only users from related 1099 data, such as the file archive. And Jody had sent out a couple emails reminding about that. And then 4448 is um, the improvements to that transmittal report, which is totals by type, which is this. So that should be the next release. And then the following release, any upcoming submission file changes for the tax year will be on that JIRA issue. And then here is another JIRA issue for standard PDF forms. Are there any questions? We do have the classic calendar year end procedures um, for both USPS and USAS next Friday. And then um, we'll have the release highlights for both um, USPSR and USASR on the December 3rd. And then December 10th is what Andrea was talking about. She'll go into the W-2 submission procedures in more detail. You can register, I provided the link for registration, and then this link will take you to this page. And I saw in the chat that this is now working for the USPS sign. So you'll be able to get that too. All right, I don't see any chat messages. I appreciate my coworkers helping out with that. Any questions before I say have a nice weekend? Okay, good luck with um, your calendar year end. Let us know if you have any questions and have a great weekend. Thanks, Thank you. you.
Thank you. You're welcome.